Um, so we're going to be doing Stissel season three. If you haven't seen, um, I did a few, I did a few videos on season one and two, um, and they're actually on YouTube. So uh, they sent that those links out to you uh, and via email. So you could check that out. My only, uh, I, I feel pretty good with the content that we we um, reviewed there. My my only um, thing that I would correct is I mistakenly interpreted uh, the Stissel family to be part of a, of a Hasidic group, but they're really Haredi, which means they're, they're not like from the more Yeshivish Lithuanian uh, strand and not from a Hasidic uh, sect. So just keep that in mind uh, when you watch, although they dress kind of like Hasidim, but um, th that was a mistake. So, uh, but otherwise I think the content's pretty good there. So we have some good content to go over today. Um, I want to just share with you what we're going to be doing. Okay. It's like a very long source sheet. But don't worry. Uh, we'll go through it in, a, in an easy and fun way with some video, of course. Um, so today we're going to talk about soulmates and surrogacy, the two S's. Okay. Um, if, if anybody know, saw se season three, they know that surrogacy is a central uh, element, central piece to the whole season. And guess what? This topic of soulmates is also, but that's throughout, throughout the whole show. Uh, basically, what we're talking about with soulmates is, is there such a, is Beshert a real thing in Judaism? Or is it just like a shtick? I don't know. So this is actually so, something that someone asked. I got this email five years ago when I was a rabbinical student. And I, I looked at like my answer was so thorough. When I was in rabbinical school, I took everything so seriously. No, I still do. But this is like a very, uh, uh, it was a good question. And, and I have some of the results of my studies like here. So he asked me this. I was wondering if you can point to the proper direction on the concept of a soulmate in Judaism. Clearly, this is apropos of this week's parshiot. I'm personally skeptical of the idea, but I'd love to hear what our Chachamim said, if anything. Okay, so that, that's the question. We're going to address that today. Talk about surrogacy. And then next week, uh, we'll talk about mental health in, in Jewish law. Um, and we have a choice to do a, there's different topics, but birth control, perhaps. Hitting, meaning uh, I know that a lot of, a lot of people, well, a lot of a lot of individuals I spoke to who are our top prayer leaders in our minion, they share with me that when they were younger, it was a little, little bit different in the chaderim, in the school, oh, in terms of how they uh, admonished and, and disciplined the kids. So we could see if that was, okay. I mean, I don't think it was okay, but we're going to see what Jewish texts have to say about that um, and how the rabbis might have um, rationalized that in their minds and how did Shalom in the show rationalize it in his mind. And also, there's a there's a law in Jewish there's a there's a law about encroachment that one person can't go and steal the business of another person, and so Shalom uh, kind of does that when it comes to him opening up his own his own seminary, and so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So that, those are going to be the general topics. Um, <clears throat> so I want to start. We're gonna do, we're gonna just start with soulmates. Let me ask you, who's the main? So who are the two? Who? Who could be seen as soulmates? You could call out, you could put text in the chat section. Who could be seen as possible soulmates in this season? Do you remember the names of the people? Yeah. <laughs> you can say it out loud or type it in the chat section. Kivi. Kiva, yeah, and, and Rachel. Rachel. And who yeah. else could really be seen as? Libby. Libby, okay, yeah, okay, good. What about somebody else that it really stands out in this in this season? Somebody who didn't wasn't a central player in previous seasons, um, who met a woman, he thought she was she was one woman, she happened to be another woman. Yasala. Yeah. Yeah. Yasala. Okay. So there's a that's what we're gonna see now. Some some footage of Yosala. Um, he goes to meet Shira M. Uh, uh, Shira L. He meets her but it's a different Shira L. So he's set up to go meet Shira Levinson. And it's, I like how that, that play on like the last name. Levinson is an Ashkenazic name. Le Levi can be a Sephardic name. So she's from Algeria. So he meets uh, a different woman. He goes out for a shidduch. Um, he ends up uh, meeting uh, a woman who has the same name as the woman he's, he's supposed to meet, but it was a different woman. And he ends up really liking her. So let's see some of that. I hope you'll be able to see this. Right. Um, so let's just, I'm going to try to get this going on my computer, but I want to just uh, just do a little bit of sources here. I'll just explain to you a little bit what happens at each part um, for this. So anyway, he, um, he ends up falling 
in love with her. He comes to his mom and says, I really love, uh, I really love um, Shira, Shira Levy. He goes, Levy? I thought it was, I thought, you went to go with Levinson. And it turns out that, uh, that he met the wrong Shira, Le- uh, Levinson, Le- Shira Levy. It was, it was Shira Levy, not Levinson. But he loved her. And he says, I want to mar- go out with her again. He says, stop, stop doing this. Uh, don't, don't, don't make things complicated for us. We're going to go out with Levinson. She's from a good family. And like they're Ashkenazic. Um, that, that's who you're going to go out with. And, and don't, don't like tarnish our name any, anymore. Anyway, he can't. He can't get over her. He's very much in love with her. And he goes out with Shira Levinson, but is not drawn to her. He even gets engaged to her. Uh, he gets engaged to her. He's trying, uh, but he's, he's not really drawn to her. And, um, and at the point when he gets, when he, um, at a certain point, he, he like, he, his mother uh, directs the father to, to tell the family, Shira Levy's family, that he's not going to, that he's not interested, that, that he's not interested anymore. So he, he doesn't know that his father told the other family that, and he just has no way to connect with this girl, Shira Levy, that he met on this one date. And so he, um, he's very sad and he goes to pray at the Kotel. He comes up from the Kotel, he ends up seeing her on the stairs and he's convinced that it's meant to be. And later on, um, even when he's, right when he's getting engaged, he's celebrating mm-hmm. it, she ends up calling him at that exact moment. And so all these pieces together um, kind of point to this idea of a, of a soulmate. And in, in his father, so I'm going to kind of just, I don't, with that, cause I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to just going to shift to the source in a second. But his father um, at a certain point even said like, you know, keep searching. If it's meant to be, it'll happen. And, and you guys will get back together. And so that's, that's, that's what ended up happening. So I want to share a little bit on this idea of the soulmate um, within Jewish texts. And I just ask that those who's uh, those who are not muted, if you can mute yourself and just unmute yourself uh, when uh, you speak, because I can hear sometimes a little bit um, like rustling. Okay, so here's the idea of of Beshert from our um, again, Shira Levy seemed to be his Beshert, and she kept coming back into his life, and it ended up working out for them, and they ended up being together. And so the question is like. What is there such a thing in Jewish texts as Beshert? And what, and is ever, and everyone, is every successful marriage based on this idea of Beshert? Or is it uh, perhaps uh, what we choose? We choose who we're going to be with, and it's not, it's not meant from heaven, uh, or it's not, it's not predestined. It's not predestined. So here's a text that people bring in this um, context. It says, um, What is meant by the verse, for I am ready? Um, this is, this is from Sanhedrin, 107a. Batsheva, the daughter of Eliam, was predestined for David from the six days of creation. Okay, so his shidduch uh, experience with her wasn't uh, so smooth either. Uh, if anybody knows the story, King David and Batsheva, um, he ended up uh, in a very complicated way, uh, ended up getting married to her. Um, but uh, it involved sin on his part, according to the simple reading of the Torah. Uh, but in the end, they ended up being together. But the Tamu wants to show how King David and her still, uh, how King David's sin wasn't so bad because she was predestined to him, for him. And so that's what he says. She was worthy for David from the six days of creation, but he enjoyed her before she was ripe. Okay, so that's uh, not focus on the language there, but more just like he, he, he went too quickly into it. But if they, they were meant to be together, um, and if he would have waited, they would have been together anyway. It's this idea of, of predestination. Okay, so um, on the other hand, there's this other, uh, port- uh, another text that talks about this. This is a debate. Okay, so pay attention. Rashmul, uh, the son of Rav Yitzhak, uh, states that when Rav Lakish began to teach the subject of Sota, he would begin by stating that a man receives a wife in accordance to his merits. So according to this text, it seems like it's according to one's merits. But then the Gemara immediately challenges, it says, 40 days before the creation of a child, a heavenly voice issues forth and proclaims the daughter of so-and-so will go to so-and-so. So it seems to be like a little bit of a debate here in the Gemara. One, one, one opinion says it's according to your merits. Another opinion says um, a heavenly voice says daughter of so-and-so will go to so-and-so. So what's the conclusion? And this is really interesting, ready? It says here, this statement is not, a, it's not difficult. Um, it's the one statement that says that it's predestined is according to your first match. 
the statement that says it goes by your deeds, that's your second match. Okay? So what does this mean? First match and second match. Was this Shira Levy was the first match and Shira Levinson was the second match? Maybe. That's, also, that's how it could be understood. Um, some people, the Kabbalists say that, and I'll just share with you, the Kabbalists say there's this idea of Zivu Grishon and a Zivu Kshani based on this, on this text in the Talmud, which basically means that we, um, we have a predestined zivug for us, a shidduch. If we don't choose that one, we can go with another one and it'll be a little bit more difficult, but we can make it work as well. So you can all think about um, how, how, how much it flows between you and your spouse and figure out now, I'm just joking. But um, <laughs> that's one approach to that. You have two options, like plan A and plan, plan, plan B. They both can work, but plan A will work out easier. That's how well, some people explain that idea of, um, other people say that no, it's talking about your first shidduch, and if something happens, you get divorced or or somebody uh, passed away, God forbid, then you have a second shidduch, and that one was not predestined. But according to this text, it the first one is predestined. However, you understand that, and if that's the case, and there's this idea of basher, um that something is meant to be, and a couple is meant to be for each other. Now, that's the general approach. Uh, this idea of basher, um is a thing in Judaism. It's the predominant approach, actually. And the and the show seems to be predicated upon that in, in terms of Shira Levy and Shira Levinson, in terms of what his father said to him, it's meant to be. And they both felt it was meant to be. Now, there is some discussion on this in the Rishonim, in the medieval commentators. They talk about, um, uh, here's like, the Rashba says, Hashem created man and woman together and then separated them. Why did God do that? So that they would later be able to come together and be joined and feel like a single unit. So they're separated, but they're really meant to be. Rambam says, though, that, um, that no, it's not, it's not the case. He says like this, uh, if marriages were predetermined and, then, and, and thus outside the control of man, why would the Torah be concerned about the engaged man going off to war? And Rambam says, if they're meant to be, so let them go out to war. They'll be together. Everything's predestined. So Rambam th- takes issue with this. And he doesn't think that there's, he doesn't believe in the concept of Bashar. Rambam. Rambam also, you, if anyone was in any of my classes, he's a rationalist, so he has difficulty in general with like these kind of concepts, predestined concepts. Um, predest- um, but for the most part, the general direction is that indeed here is that the exception of the Rambam, Meiri, and Chatzon Sever, um, the majority of the Rishonim embrace the concept of a single predetermined partner. Okay, so this is not a foreign concept to our text, it actually is, is pretty central in our text. I want to share with you two other texts connect this, and then we'll move on to surrogacy in Jewish law. So, uh, yeah. so if, the, if it's predetermined, what is the job of the matchmaker? The matchmaker is to help them get together. Oh. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Sometimes the matchmaker will connect them. Sometimes the people will just go on to, uh, I don't know, I had this one friend who's working with a matchmaker for years, and then uh, he decided to finally join, I think it was Jay Swipe, and, he, uh, and I ended up marrying them, uh, not me, I ended up helping them get married. Um, yeah like two years ago at our shul, uh, they, they met each other in J-Swipe while he was passing through an airport and she was passing through and they were in each other's vicinity and they were able to, uh, to connect with each other that way. So sometimes the, sure. yeah. the matchmaker will be their, their vehicle, sometimes mm-hmm. not. Now, again, those who, don't, who are suspect, like that person who sent me an email originally, like I'm suspect of this, of this concept, you have your sources as well. You have Rambam, Meiri, and others who show that you know, a lot, some of it's due to human act, it's due to human action and not necessarily due to pre, something being predetermined. Um, but I want to share with you two more texts on this. Yeah, I saw someone raised Yeah, yeah. Rabbi Yogev, one of the things on this issue before you go into surrogacy uh, was when he, Yossi tells his mom, trying to make the case, but I love her. And she says, love, what is that? Love, love, well, what is that going to do with yeah. anything? It's not even a concept in the Jewish yeah. religion about love. People talk about that there's like the Rachel model and the Leah model in terms of get, in terms of marriage. Um, one of my rabbis talked about this. Like the Leah model is like Leah had a lot of children. That was about the future. The Rachel model is the idea of the romance, the connection. Like he loved her so much that he would do anything for her. And you really need those two aspects. Those two aspects in a successful marriage. That's why the, the prophet says that Leah and Rachel built Israel. But those communities put a little, perhaps put a little more, more emphasis on the Leah aspect, the idea of family and children. But, but I think she was also doing that because she was like, if, his, if Yosela came back and said, I love Shira Levinson, I, I think she wouldn't have had an issue either. Meaning 
it's Shira Levy and she's trying to bring an argument against it. So um, I don't think she would be against love and connection. Okay, but here's, um, here's just two more texts on this topic. Um, I don't want to get to us to get to surrogacy. Okay, so we say for the most part, the general direction is that, um, that there is a belief in this idea of Bashar. Now, somebody came to Rav Moshe Feinstein, Feinstein the head posek, uh, and they actually, they actually showed us this source in Yeshiva, maybe like 20 years ago. Um, basically, they said, don't, don't be too picky. They said something like this. Um, Rav Moshe was asked whether, if, um, can a, a person came up to Rav Moshe and asked this question. Says, you know, can I taste uh, my, my this woman's food before, before I get ma- before I get married to her? I want to make sure the food's good because I'm gonna have to eat that food for the rest of my life. <laughs> so he asked Rav, to ask Rav Moshe that. Rav Moshe uh, said to him, he goes, you know, um, there's no issue with this, but practically, it's one shouldn't overthink the issue. And he says, here's what you need to think about when you're going on a shidduch: that one finds the shidduch attractive, that she comes from a good family and that she has a good reputation for being a religious observant Jew. Okay, then he says, if these three are met, one shouldn't overthink it, but go through with the engagement in the hope that she is the one prepared for him from Shemayim. Meaning, he's saying, you can't always know who's going to be prepared for you from heaven. You do your best, and you hope that, she, that that's the one. And he says in the end, be simple with Hashem. Tamim tiyem Hashem elokecha. Be simple with Hashem. And so even if we, you, one does believe in this idea of soulmates, you can't always like work technically based on that understanding you do you know and our Moshe says just you know do your best and be simple with Hashem and Hashem will help you and that's his final text here which I love this text like let's say you even don't believe in that uh, things are predetermined well no one ever said Hashem's not involved in bringing shidduchs together though right so this is this last text it's like a funny text but it's good where it talks about how Hashem is involved in the process of bringing zivuks together. It says, this woman came to Rabbi Yosef Bar Chalafta and say, said to him, how many days did it take the Holy One to create the world? Holy One to create the world. Six days. <clears throat> she said to him, what has God been doing since that hour and now? He said to her, the Holy One, blessed be he, he sits and matches, matches. He, he makes shidduchs. That's what God's doing. The daughter of this one, of that one, the wife of this one, of this one, the money of this one, to this one. So she said to him, this woman said to, said to this rabbi, this is all, this is what he does. Even I could do that. How many servants, how many maidservants do I have? I could match them. He said to her, okay, if it's so easy, go try it. For Hashem, it's as difficult as splitting of the sea. So she goes, she took her leave. Next day, she lined up a thousand male and a thousand female slaves and paired them off before nightfall. It sounds like one of those, like, um, one of those shows on like The Bachelor or something like that, but it's only with one there, but here's like a thousand verse. The morning after her state resembled a battlefield. One slave had his head bashed in, another lost an eye, while a third hollowed because of a broken leg. No one seemed to want or be assigned or his or her assigned mate. Quickly she summoned Rabbi Yossi and knowledge. Your God is unique and your Torah is true, pleasing and praiseworthy. You spoke wisely. Meaning it's not so simple to connect people. And even if you don't believe there's such thing as a Bashar, um, there is this idea of be simple with God, believe that God helps you, and God does, and God is involved with the matchmaking process. So those, that's like, like that's a, I think that's more like a balanced way to understand on um, that topic. So if you would ask me, um, I think the show is going by the approach that there is such thing as soulmates, and Shira Levy is kind of embodying that uh, with Yossi. There are a lot of other connections, like um, like with the Kiva and Libby and um, Shulam and Devora. Um, they're all kind of depicted at the end of the show, actually. Uh, Mark, Dr. Lee pointed that out to me. They're all together there at the end. All right, so um, I'm going to move on to the topic of surrogacy. I'm just going to see if I can share my screen with you here on my other, on my other computer. Uh, okay, sadly, sadly, that's not working. But you know what? We can still study together and talk about this. Okay, so um, and we'll try to get better for next week. Uh, so we have this topic of surrogacy in the show. Um, the, uh, the woman played by Shira Haas. Uh, what's from my name in the show? An Orthodox? In this show. Ruchami. Ruchami. Okay, that's also her name's interesting, right? Ruchami, Rechem. Rechem is the womb. So that could be connected. I don't know. So Ruchami, um, Ruchami has, uh, she has uh, intrauterine device uh, in, in, inside of her um, to, uh, because if she ever gets pregnant and gives birth, it can endanger her life. She has like one in a thousand chance 
of surviving. And she once, uh, she once was pregnant. She almost, uh, this like, they, they did a re, like a, re, like they went back to this. She once was pregnant. Um, and she, it was very dangerous. She ended up, um, uh, giving birth, uh, giving birth, but the baby was stillborn and she had to, she had to bury it. And it was very traumatic for them. And so the doctor said, don't ever, don't ever get, you can't get pregnant again. It's you're, you're risking your life. And the rabbi, came down and said by the way the rabbi the rosh yeshiva um is is the head character from ushbizim if you didn't if you didn't pay attention to that he's just like 30 like 20 30 years older actually so just check that out when you get a chance um great actor shuli rand he's also a singer by the way um so <clears throat> anyway so she she has an intrauterine uh, iud um and that's that's enabled them to, to have relations but to not get pregnant now, at a certain point, um, she, she wants to remove that, and she wants to try it, try it out to, to get pregnant and take the chances. But, um, but she goes to a doctor, and the doctor kind of, uh, uh, he, he goes, he, he goes, she goes to the doctor, unbeknownst to her husband, and the doctor ends up calling her husband and telling him that she's, she's trying to do this to remove the IUD, and that it's going to be very dangerous for her. So the husband has no choice but to try to go a different path with her. And this is the path of surrogacy. He doesn't really want to do it. He's very uncomfortable with this idea of surrogacy, which is the idea that they'll take her, the woman's, um, Rukhami's, um, take her eggs and they'll um, insemin inseminate them and then implant them in, uh, in a carrier. Should be another woman who they actually don't want to meet. <clears throat> and that woman would carry it till birth. <clears throat> and the husband's very, Hanina is very uncomfortable with this. He's going along with it because he, he said basically at a certain point, he says, <clears throat> if she, if she gets, if she um, doesn't have a baby, uh, if she, if she has a baby, she could die. If she doesn't have a baby, she could die also because it's something so essential to, to who she is. Um, so he's trying to fight, goes to his rabbi, the Rosh Hashiva, Shuli Rand, and says, you know, what do I do? What's the halacha? I know, I know it's forbidden. Surrogacy is forbidden in Jewish law, but is there any loophole? Is there any way around it? And the rabbi agrees. He says, yeah, um, in the first place, it's forbidden. Um, but this is not, this is bidieva. This is like not in the first place. This is, um, this is a very, um, complicated situation in the end the rabbi kind of throws it back at him actually and says you'll figure you'll, you'll figure it out um and he actually does end up getting clarity clarity um he ends up going trying to go forward with it but in the end they end up not going forward with the surrogacy and um i don't want to like spoil it for you but Ruhami ends up um, they end up not going forward with the, the surrogacy and you and who those who know, have seen it will know what happens those who don't hopefully we'll get to see what happens um but so why was he so uncomfortable? Like if Jewish law is complete, if it's completely forbidden in Jewish law, so um, it wouldn't have been a question at all. And if it's, for if it's permitted to some extent surrogacy, um, then, then why was he so conflicted? Okay, that's the question. Right. Um, and it seems like even when she presents the, the, the reality where she was trying to, uh, she's going to, kind of pretend she was pregnant and then uh and then have another woman give birth to the baby um when she presented this idea to her sister kitty she's like really the rabbi allowed that um and uh so the, the she was surprised by it too but then she said once the rabbi said it's okay it's okay everyone was like surprised so what are the issues in, uh what are the issues with uh, surrogacy and jewish law? like what 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 and why is there why is there a place to say it could be permitted that's the kind of the topic i want to talk about here um, so I'll just throw it out to you for a second. What do you think could be some possible issues with, uh, with this, with the, with the idea of like, a, um, of surrogacy? What do you think? I think it had something to do with what will the neighbors think? Like right. in a lot of Orthodox questions, which kind of bothers me that should, in my mind, that just should not be the sole concern of, should I put pillows under my dress so they'll think I'm really pregnant and, you know, I can put one over on them. 
I don't get it. I, I, I think it's a question of who's the mother because we, we put a lot of weight by the mother. Well, the egg, I mean, scientifically, we know that the mother of the, is really the, the person who gave her eggs. However, this is the woman who bore the child and delivered the child. And I think the way things are in the Torah, they talk about people who carry the children, deliver the children. Wonderful. This, yeah, so, so it's, it becomes a, a, a question who's the mother, and that's important in Judaism. Very important. So you both named two important pieces. Um, what, what could be another issue? Any, any other issues that might come up with surrogacy? Very straightforward. Let's say you, uh, a husband, um, Hanina, if, if this other woman who's giving birth to the baby in practice, like on the ground, um, hopefully not on the ground. I mean, she's, you know what I'm talking about. She's giving birth to the baby. Um, uh, if he was with that woman in real life, that would be adultery, All right? So there's somebody, there's another player in the mix here. Adultery is a very bad thing in Judaism. So it's getting very close to that. Another issue is, um, is uh, masturbation or, 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 or wasting seed. You know, there's some of the, um, there's, that, that's also an issue. So that's also raised um, in the discussions around this. So let's, let's talk, let's kind of jump right in. It wasn't being wasted. It was going to be used. <laughs> that's the counter argument. So like, so, that's the counter argument, but it's not used in a, nat in a natural way. And a lot of it isn't used to fertilize, uh, to fertilize, but you can also say like, that doesn't happen. Like a, a lot of it isn't used all the time to fertilize as well. That's why there's, there's d different sides to that, right. but yes, you, you are correct in pointing that out. All right. So let's see what some of the, some of the aspects here are. So you, you mentioned a lot of them. Here's another one that you didn't talk about. Does one, does one actually perform the mitzvah of pruravu, refu from multiply in this roundabout way? So the husband, at least the husband's obligated in this mitzvah of pruravu, refu from multiply when his, uh, his, his seed, his semen is, um, uh, inseminate it, it, it's inserted into somebody and in somebody else's body um is into this into the egg and it's done in a natural way is he actually performing the mitzvah uh, of pruravu being fruitful all of those so the answer to that is a lot a lot of a lot of um rabbis say that that does fulfill pruravu even if it's through artificial insemination and other forms um, like other non-standard for uh formats um but the main question I want to focus on, and, and Heidi mentioned not the way of Amisrael, they were ashamed. Another thing I want to mention is who's, I want to focus on like, who is the mother? That's kind of like the topic I want to focus on, which Anne touched on that. Um, but before we do that, let's just talk about um, what, what were the sides to IVF being permitted? Like what's the halacha, the practical halacha? So the, the more extreme stance on this is Rob Eliezer Waldenberg. He objected to the entire procedure of IV, IVF, right? He says, um, when, whenever the fertilization, fertilization fails, the husband is ejaculated to waste. So you could obviously argue, well, when a, when a couple is together and they don't have, I mean, they don't have, uh, the wife doesn't get pregnant from, from their union. Is that also being to waste? I mean, but anyway, even when one sperm cell does fertilize the egg, Rob Wallenberg knows that the rest of the semen goes to waste. Okay, so there's, there's a pushback on this, but this is what he says. Rob Wallenberg further claims that one does not fulfill the myths that I have children on any, on any level through IVF. He says, what does one gain by presenting a way to create children in this manner? If the creators of this child do not fulfill any divine command and the practice of IVF will create profound and complex problems. So he's very, very, um, comes down very hard on this. Um, he also has concern for cloning. He has a lot of issues with it. Um, other authorities, the Ravavadi Yosef, the central authority, permits IV, IVF for an infertile, infertile couple. He specifically permits IVF with, when the wife's eggs are being fertilized. But he does not address the propriety of IVF when, when another woman donates the egg. Okay. Shalom Eliashiv also permits IVF when the wife's eggs are used but not using the, wife, the eggs of another of a, other woman. So you see how there's like some different opinions on this. Um, okay. Although most authorities do not fundamentally object to IVF, at least for married couples, several major problems do arise during IVF procedures. Procuring the husband's sperm in a halakhic accepted manner, the permissibly paying a woman to donate an ovum, 
and concern for the possibility of mom's a root or the donor. So in general, it's this is like the complicated complications that there's strict authorities that say that it's forbidden. Some authorities will allow it, will allow for it, especially if there's a need. So that's kind of like where the halacha is in those communities. Um, it's it would be more looked down upon. And I guess in more modern communities, there'd be more open openness to this. Um, but I want to talk about the one halachic piece that's actually kind of pretty interesting, this idea of who is the mother? Who is the mother and what does it matter? So Anne, Anne touched on this. It does matter. Incest laws, let's say uh, the mother is, um, is the, 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 the carrier, the just gestational surrogate, right? So if that woman has children, as a, it gives birth to a boy, uh, in this in this birthing process and had a girl from an earlier time period, that boy can never get married to that girl. But if the donor of the egg is the mother, so that boy perhaps can get married to that girl, to that woman when they get older, because the the second the woman who gave birth to the to the baby was not the child's real mother. So that's like one inheritance also, uh, Pijona Ben. So you're supposed to redeem the firstborn. If the donor already had a child, so and the donor's the mother, then there won't be a pigeon of them. Uh, similarly, if the carrier is already had a baby, uh, a child, and then she, then she has a, this, this, a boy afterwards, she also won't do to be on it. So she won't do redemption of the firstborn. So it goes in terms of mourning. Who do you mourn for? So you see, there's a lot. Let's say it was a non-Jewish woman who carried the baby. So if we go by the carrier. Um, that baby might have to convert. Okay, so here, that's like the different um, different sides to this. Let me just share with you some some texts that are brought in this discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll just jump really quickly to the practical halacha and then I'll show you like some of the deliberations connected to it. But so halachically, who's the mother? How do, how do we decide who's the mother? Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein and Rabbi Mordechai, Mordechai Willig told of Chaim Jachter that they're inclined to believe that the woman who donates the ovum is the halachic mother. Okay, so that's kind of, I guess, maybe that aligns with, I think Anne said it's, that's like more like the scientific approach now, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what it's like, what the consensus is in, in like scientific circles, but they align with that. But, but, but the general direction that's usually offered is this, actually. Absent a clear consensus, Rav Shlomo Zaman Auerbach and Rav Zanon Goldberg and Rav Feinstein and Rav Blech, uh, rule that one must act strictly in accordance with both opinions. So basically, if one of the women was non-Jewish, um, the baby should convert out of doubt because we, we go by the idea that both of the mothers uh, count uh, in, in terms of being strict. I guess you would sit shiva for both of them, I guess. In terms of inheriting, I guess, what would you inherit from both of them? I don't know, that actually worked out nicely. But um, anyway, um, so that's like a little bit in terms of like the practical halacha. But I was talking to you like a little bit about the deliberations, do this like four or five minutes. There's some weird ones and there's some, some actually kind of logical ones. Well, I'm not saying none of them are like weird, but like they're just creative, I would say. Okay, and I could see, I can, I can assume that some people would raise some eyebrows when I'm discussing it. Like, how'd they get from there to there? So here's one that people bring a lot, but whenever I mention it, people like giggle. Okay, but it says that uh, Leah, and I'm not going to go into too many of these, but it says the but here's the deliberations. This is the, this is to the view that says, that the surrogate, the, uh, the, the woman who's carrying the baby to birth, she is the mother. Here's, the, the, here's the, an argument for that. It says that Leah, she bore, uh, she bore, uh, ya, um, Yaakov, uh, she bore Yaakov six children, okay? So she bore him a daughter and named her Dina. Fine, okay, that's, that's fine. That's like the simple reading of the Torah. Now the Talmud says, when Leah, uh, when Leah, Leah why do you call, why Leah call her Dina? Dina means judgment. She passed judgment on herself. She said, 12 tribes are destined to stem from Jacob. Six came from me and four from the maidservants. That is 10. And if this fetus is male, my sister Rachel will not even be the equivalent of one of the maidservants. Rachel will only have one. The maidservants will have two and two. And then she'll have seven. So what did she do? She prayed. She prayed. And, uh, and immediately the fetus was transformed into a daughter. Okay, so, so Leah, Leah's child was pray, transformed into a daughter, and she named the daughter Dina, meaning she named her after her judgment. So Targum Yonatan says like this, the fetuses were switched in their stomachs. So Rachel had Yosef in her stomach. 
uh, sorry, um, Leah had Leia had Yosef in her stomach. Rachel had Dean in her stomach. Okay, pay close attention. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Leah had Rachel in her stomach. Sorry, Leah had Leah had Yosef in her stomach. Rachel had Dina in her stomach. They prayed and they switched. Okay, before they were born. Okay, this is a midrash. Okay, I know. I see Carol like shaking her head there. Um, okay, but. It says that nevertheless, even though they flipped before they were born, it says that the carrier who was Leah gave birth to Dina. So Leah once upon a time had a boy, but then it got flipped to a girl and we go by who she gave birth to. I get a, a round of applause for that one? No, okay. So that's one explanation. Well, I'll give you, I'm, that's a got it But I want to tell you a halachic, a halachic argument, okay? That actually is brought, so I wanted to show you that. But here's a halachic argument. It's an interesting halakhic argument, okay? It says, if a mother, here it is, a mother has, a mother uh, does, converts with, while she has tw uh, twins in her stomach, what's the halakhic status of those twins that she gives birth to? So if they were not conceived in sanctity, but their birth was in sanctity, meaning she had two twins in her stomach, they were non-Jews when they were conceived. Because they were in the mother's womb, was a non-Jew. She converted in the let's say the sixth month, the fifth month. She gives birth to them. What's their status? Their status is that they're born as Jews. I think this is a strong argument for the idea that we go by the birth, because they have one status before. When they came out, they came out as her status when she was uh, when she gave birth to them. So that's I think the strongest source for the birth the gestational um, uh, surrogate. Now here, the, uh, on the other hand, we have, um, and that's a halacha. So if there ever, these, these um, if these two brothers, ha one of the brothers who, who were born ends up being with another brother's wife, uh, it's forbidden because they're both Jews and, they're, and they're, they're liable for all the laws connected to Jews and you can't be with your brother's wife. Okay, so an argument for the genetic donor We'll just go two more minutes and we'll be done. Um, an argument for the genetic donor is uh, there's this, this is a somewhat of okay source. The father, um, there's a source that says there are three partners in the creation of a person, the Holy One, blessed be he, the father and the mother. The father seeds the white substance from, the, from which the bone, sinew, nails, brain, and the white of, an, of the eye are formed. The mother seeds the red substance from which the skin, flesh, hair, black, and white of the eye are formed. So see, you see here there's some sort of genetic contribution from each side that defines the mother and father as the mother and father. So here could be argument for the genetic contribution of the donor, the mother, the mother who donated her egg um, to be called the mother. And here's another case from the Talmud, which is interesting. It says, um, a fetus was transferred from one animal to another. This is from Chulin. The Talmud states that the fetus is not the offspring of the second animal, despite the fact that the second animal gave birth to the fetus. So we have precedent for this idea of one, one animal, one being being transferred to the, to, the, to the womb of another, but it's mother being considered the donor, uh, the, the original, the, the original uh, the animal that donated or kind of implanted their fetus into the other animal. So here's some supports on both sides. Um, I'm not gonna get into this last case, but basically that's kind of like, um, some of the deliberations connected. It's it's complicated because these are all new halachot. So you have to go and some some people are going to midrash with Leia. Other people go to more technical halachic sources for this. There's one more interesting source with an orla branch. Yeah, this branch is categorized in orla, and if you put it on a tree that's not in this category of orla, uh, people say that it takes on the character of the tree it's on. It doesn't have any of the laws of the orla. So from there they want to say it goes by the carrier. This is, this is from botany and agriculture, and they're transferring it over to, to, to humans. But um, I'll just sum up. So we talked about soulmates, and we talked about surrogacy. Soulmates, it seems like there's good support for this idea of Bashar. But in the end, Hashem's involved anyway, and we have to be simple. And the idea of surrogacy, um, it's complicated. Uh, Rav Eliezer Waldemar came out very strong against it. Other authorities find, uh, can find some place for it. 
um, in, in dire situations, like in a situation, uh, especially in dire situations like in our, in our show, um, but it's very complicated and it, it also presents new complicated situations, which we weren't, which we didn't have in earlier generations. We had this idea of with animals and agriculture and the Midrash, but these are all ancient cases they're trying to extrapolate from there to who would be de deemed the mother today. Halakhically, um, the mother is defined as, um, we just go by both of them actually, and we're just strict. We say that the, if, if there's a non-Jewish woman, um, that the baby should convert, whether it's either the donor or the carrier. 